Hello, everyone. I hope you can see me and hear me clearly. It's four o'clock, and here's the third lecture in this week's Unacademy series, India's Youthful Re Reawakening. Well, what do we mean by that? It's essentially about the way in which the equity of youth is driving potentially our future growth. As you all know, you must have heard it often enough as a cliche, half of India's current population, which is over 1.3 billion now, is under the age of 26. And of course, uh, the assumption is that an increase in the population of the youthful workforce would generate a demographic dividend that is usually a huge advantage for any country's economic growth. And, and the logic is very simple. We're looking at um, the fact that we are the youngest economy in the world, at least amongst the major economies, at a time when many of our potential competitors, China, Japan, South Korea, are facing a serious demographic squeeze. And of course, the rest of the world is aging. In Europe, the average age is projected to reach 46 this year. In Japan, it's going to be 47. Even in relatively youthful immigrant fuel America, it's going to be 40. And the average age in India by the end of this year will be 29. So we have a huge young population, 65% under 35, uh, a young country, where in theory, at least our fresh young uh, people will be joining a dynamic, competitive, productive, and a youthful workforce, which could be an engine for the world primed to take over that role from China. In fact, the International Labour Organization, the ILO, has predicted that by 2020, we will have in India, and that's this year, so I hope that's about right now, 116 million workers in the job starting age group of 20 to 24. We'll only have 94 million. In other words, we've turned the tables in China. We're the youthful workforce. We could have the labor force that could change the world. And our situation compares very well with the industrialized world because as our labor force is growing, theirs is shrinking. It's reduced by 4% in the last few years. China has gone down by 5% in the last five years, but ours has increased by 32%. So as far as the age structure and potential are concerned, it's a huge competitive advantage for India. And this is the time to seize that advantage become the engine of the world, the manufacturing dynamo of the world, a skill provider for the world. And of course, at the same time, because these young people are themselves consumers, they will make India, at least in theory, a domestic demand-driven economy. Uh, the positive side of this narrative is they're full of ideas, energy, and passion. Um, they themselves are reacting to a changing world, so they're bringing about meaningful changes in social behavior and attitudes. They're willing to challenge the stereotypes. They're willing to embrace good practices. They're willing to think out of the box. Uh, the young people generally don't like hearing an argument that says something is like this because it's always been like this. They're prepared to say, why can't it be some other way? And in all these ways, they can contribute to the country's overall development. But, and there is a but, I'm sorry to say, the but is that all these factors, plus ease of mobility in India, as we've seen with all the migrant laborers during COVID, uh, the workforce advantage, the demographic dividend, all of this will only work in our favor if we can educate and train our young people to seize the opportunities available to them in the 21st century. And there we are failing. The skill development has largely remained a mantra without a method. And the alarming dropout rate from our government schools has not been compensated for by any significant increase in vocational training opportunities to cater to their needs. This raises, obviously, very interesting and significant problems. Um, we have a very high unemployment rate. And um, while 15 million youngsters are entering the workforce annually, each of the next five years, We'll have 15 million new entrants into the workforce. Over 75% of them will not be ready for their jobs. In fact, um, there, there's, there's some rather unfortunate details about all of this that are worth mentioning. Um, we, we have a, a systemic problem uh, of skill mismatch between the qualifications of our young people and the jobs they're required to undertake. I mean, I think many of you will remember reading with shock and horror uh, a story a couple of years ago from the Madhya Pradesh Police Department, 
which had advertised 14,000 constable posts, right? Constable posts just required a school pass out education. Nine lakh candidates applied for just 14,000 jobs, and amongst them were nearly 10,000 engineering graduates, a dozen PhD holders, 1,90,000 graduates, 15,000 postgraduates. All this for a low position requiring just a high school degree. In other words, we seem to be releasing graduates into an ecosystem that does not know how to use them. And that's why they're settled even for a constable post. A policy that encourages vocational study so that non-graduate technical and non-diploma certificate holders are better equipped for occupations would help to close the skills gap and reduce the pressure on graduate higher education as well. And, and the other thing is that too many graduates are overqualified for the jobs available. I don't just mean the constable post. Um, we have a challenge that the talent that we have doesn't match what the marketplace wants. Do you know that some 60% of our engineers, for instance, find the jobs that do not require an engineering degree? And I'm not even counting those engineers who get no jobs at all. I remember the organization I lead, the All India Professionals Congress, conducted a survey of some 60,000 engineering graduates, mainly in Kerala, and they found that 65% of them said that their jobs had no connection to what they had studied or that they didn't feel their degree had any relevance to the work they were actually doing. And that's a pretty painful reality that our people is coping with. On top of that, there's severe gender imbalance. Many of our women um, uh, are not getting fair representation in the workforce, and particularly in senior echelons. The workforce is overwhelmingly informal. Out of the 520 million people in our, in our country's workforce, it's estimated that 80% of them are in the informal sector, not the organized sector. Uh, no formal contracts, no union rights. Um, they're essentially a combination of self-employed, partially employed, um, uh, disguised unemployment in some cases, and informally employed for the rest of them. Now, the challenge of all of this is that, on the whole, our workforce doesn't have good access to education. That includes vocational training. It doesn't have good nutrition. It doesn't have good health. So we're going to put ourselves into a particularly difficult problem in dealing with. Now, what do we do to use the potential of the young population? Clearly, there's a need to increase and sustain our country's GDP growth, obviously to reduce poverty, to enhance human capabilities. And the government has to put forward the right policies and plans. And some of the policies have to be put forward by the central government, some by the state governments. Some of the policies for an aging state like Kerala which is not just an aging state, but a shrinking population. In the next census, my state, Kerala, will actually be the first Indian state to show a decrease in population from the 2011 census. And I think uh, by 2031, Andhra Pradesh is expected to follow the suit. Now, this is very different from Bihar or UP, where the demographic imbalance is in favor of the young and where they are also growing in large numbers. And then there's a the question of inequality amongst genders, between castes, and between the urban and the rural population. When we talk about all of this, uh, there's no question that one important area we need to focus on, undoubtedly, is coming to uh, improved technical and technological capacity. Uh, if you want a strong, robust, and self-sufficient economy and society, uh, we will have to invest a lot more in long-term research. And that's something that... Um, that, that I'm going to return to, uh, I'll come to the next slide in a minute, but I think we will have to see um, what the possibilities are in that area. Now, when we look at, at what the, the country is offering at this moment, um, Make in India is the best known slogan. I'm going to come to that in a minute because I do want to talk a little bit more uh, about research. I, I have a, uh, a feeling that we are... Uh, yes, we have we have left that slide out. I apologize, but I will nonetheless um, tell you what I intended to say about this. If you look at the way in which investments in long-term research have a very direct impact on any nation's continued future success, 
we have to accept that we are doing rather badly uh, in, in this regard. We have only awarded uh, some 50,000 MPhil and doctorate degrees uh, a year, and that's according to the Department of Science and Technology, the Government of India. Our patent applications as, are actually going down from previous years, whereas a country like China shoots up. Uh, we have fewer patent applications, I think 45,000 odd last year, and our spending on research and development at about 0.6% of GDP is way below what it should be. Um, in fact, uh, when the UPA government was in power, I used to complain that we were only spending 0.9 on R&D. It's actually gone down to 0.6 in the years since. Major nations spend much more. The US spends 2.8%, China spends 2.1% of their GDP, but even small countries, Korea spends 4.2%, Israel spends 4.3%, because they recognize that long-term economic growth depends ultimately on innovation and invention, and that is connected very much to productivity. So you really need to get into uh, creating an ecosystem for research and development so that research-led innovation will actually play a significant role in our, our national output. And that's the only way that we can actually become a, a land of enhanced opportunities. Now, to come back to the current slide, uh, we talk about employment generation, but innovation is an indispensable element in generating employment. We need to become a manufacturing powerhouse in order to gainfully employ the big power labor pool. But we're having real problems doing that, partly because we have serious inefficiencies and high costs, uh, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, while I'm still staying on the positives, we do have a large domestic market and increasing domestic demand. It's interesting, one of the factors, uh, apart from the remittances from our Indians abroad, one factor that helped us weather the last global recession was the fact that the Indian economy was still overwhelmingly consisting of Indians making and selling goods and services to other Indians. So we were less affected by the, uh, the, the, the setbacks in the, uh, in the export uh, and import business that happened because of the global recession. If you look at uh, China's um, uh, manufacturing um, in, in, uh, in, in uh, man manufacturing advantage, they have a big competitive advantage all these years, that is eroding. The labor force is shrinking. They're demanding actually more salaries. Um, but instead of India being able to seize this opportunity to take some share of global manufacturing away from China, we are finding ourselves in a slightly uh, difficult position because it's countries um, which have cheaper land and labor costs, like Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, and others, uh, that are even Malaysia and Thailand, are taking away some of the manufacturing that is leaving China. Um, one challenge we have is indeed, in addition to land and labor, regulation. Despite the Prime Minister's best intentions and his speeches about ease of doing business, we still have a very high regulatory burden that we impose on businesses, number of permissions, clearances, a lot of paperwork. Uh, and as a result, companies say it's, it's much easier to work somewhere else. That again will have to be dealt with. Now, um, one of the issues of imports that's come uh, defense, the defense sector is an area in which we have, as you know, permitted foreign investment now in order to reduce our dependence on imports because we are increasingly conscious of our vulnerability to external suppliers, particularly after the interruption of supply chains during this virus. And that's something also that we would probably need to see much growth in. So what do we do? What do we need to do to overcome the hurdles related uh, to make in India? Uh, I, I haven't got it on the slide, but one thing we have to accept is that we cannot overcome the hurdles of trying to get companies to make in India something which they're not making through human beings anywhere. That is, the advances in robotics have meant that some companies that might have intended to invest in India many years ago 
are no longer willing to do so because it's cheaper for them to make a one-time investment in a robotic-driven, automated manufacturing process, which will then pay off by being cheaper in the longer term than human beings who, after all, need lunch breaks and loo breaks and salaries and can negotiate for more and all of that. So labor costs can go up. Running a robot is often a continuing uh, low expense for a company that's made the invest initial investment. So that's also been a hurdle for, for Make in India, unless India too can find a way of becoming a leader in that field of robotics. But aside from that, uh, what are the questions that I pick up when I talk to business groups and entrepreneurs, industrialists? One is tax terrorism. Uh, we have had an unfortunate habit, particularly, I'm sorry to say, in the current government of setting targets for revenue officials and tax officials. And they have to meet those targets. So they go out and they terrorize business people, including honest business people, in order to be able to find something that would enable them to meet their targets. This approach has to stop. We will get better compliance without tax terrorism. Infrastructure improvements. Um, we are seeing good progress in some areas. Our airports are a lot better than they used to be. Mr. Gadkari has been focusing on ports a lot. The progress has been better in the private sector ports and in the government ports. But other infrastructural improvements have been slow in coming. Our railways is way behind where it was intended to be in terms of improved infrastructure, more automatic signaling, more electrical trains, more uh, uh, and faster trains, including now the famous bullet train, which is also presumably now on hold along with everything else. That's supposed to be uh, uh, an area which we would have to fix. Our roads um, are no good. Our, our freight costs on, on railways are far too high. All of these things. Um, so that an investor coming in and setting up a factory will need to feel comfortable that they can get their goods on good and smooth roads to a port or an airport uh, and have it processed very quickly and out to the markets they need to reach it to. Otherwise, make in India will suffer from that. Skills development I've already talked about. We can't just talk about skills development. We have to create skills. It's shocking that in a country of 1.3 billion people, for example, to very recently anyway, there was a nationwide shortage of masons. Masons are qualified people used in the conduct construction industry. We have so much construction in our country. What happened? Well, all the masons with diplomas and certificates are away working, working in the Gulf. And as a result, they weren't in our country. Um, this sort of thing uh, is, 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 is a pity. Too many of our, our plumbers are self-taught. Our automobile mechanics have been learning on the job. Uh, we need to be able to train and qualify people so they have skills, first of all, where they are and can also uh, be portable skills. We have a cultural problem here, which I've not put on the slide, but it's true. Um, after all, in our country, let's say you want to be a potter or a carpenter, you better have an uncle or a father who's a potter or a carpenter because nobody else is going to teach you. Professions are handed down the generations, down, up and down the family tree. And that is indeed how the caste system began and perpetuated itself. That's not good enough. Skills have to go with talent and not through the gene pool. We need to encourage the setting up of more skill institutes. I had a pet scheme that I never persuaded anybody to, to adopt of a requiring every large company beyond a certain size of employees, requiring them to offer vocational training, not just to their own employees, but to outsiders, students. And indeed, they could have them potentially the best lot, best of the lot, could be captive pool for recruitment by those companies, but the rest would have a certificate of training from a reputable company that they could then use to take their skills, market their skills elsewhere, and, and, and move around. Simplify the process of acquiring land. That's easier said than done. Land acquisition is a challenge in a very densely populated country, but the government will have to give it some very serious thought because if, in, if industrialists can't get land, where will they build their factories? How will they make in India? The GST um, implementation is a complicated issue because there are many things about GST that's finally being ironed out. It was probably introduced 
with undue haste and without adequate planning. The internet backbone for GST, the TIN, kept collapsing. Um, many times it wasn't possible for people to upload their returns. And on top of that, there were too many returns being required. Some of these kinks have been ironed out. If we can implement this to make it a smooth, simple, easy process uh, and heading in the right direction, uh, then we will certainly make, uh, make it easier. To, uh, to do business in India. And fast track bureaucratic approvals is everyone's favorite requirement. You basically must get rid of the heavy hand of bureaucracy in the moving of files, permissions, and clearances. And that's something I'll return to, I'm sure, before we end today. Making India 2.0 today, the government tells us, aims to make India a global hub for manufacturing, research, and innovation, and an integral part of the global supply chain. If there is going to be much of a global supply chain post-COVID, we'll talk about that also. Um, the fact is that we clearly need to formulate and implement pretty rigorous, rigorously a clear strategy for an industrial policy. What are the priority sectors that we must give encouragement to? Do we need to give tax breaks? What kind of favorable policy environment can come out of our government? Uh, some sectors uh, in India were doing very well uh, before the the recent crisis. The automobile sector started laying people off last year before COVID, but till then they were doing extremely well. They were a growth industry and they were contributing heavily to exports as well, both automobiles, assembled automobiles and automobile spare parts. Uh, machinery, similarly, pharma, pharmaceuticals, we were a world leader. Those are areas we really ought to recapture global leadership. That requires a dialogue between the government and the private sector, which some private sector executives have told me has been lacking of late. That is that while the government started off with the right intentions, many business people feel, initially they were happy there wasn't much dialogue. They said at least we don't have to go and demand any, uh, any favors, any sifarish, we don't have to butter up any government officials or ministers, they'll leave us to do our work. But when problems are encountered, regulatory challenges, issues requiring government intervention, there's no one to talk to either, or so the private sector people tell me, and that needs to be improved. Uh, strengthening MSMEs, the, the micro, small, and medium uh, industries, uh, these entrepreneurs, um, when we say micro, we're talking about two to seven employees. Small would be under 100, uh, under 250, I think, and, and, and medium would be about 250 employees. Um, these uh, need to... Um, need to um, need to uh, achieve economies of scale, which means it's difficult for small small players in the economy to be able to achieve scale. The government's going to help them to be able to do that. But equally, they've got to be given understanding. They've already, uh, the micro ones in particular, were badly hit by demonetization because they depended very much on people coming in the morning with a job of work, paying them when it was done at the end of the day. They paid their workers out of that money and kept their profits. When liquidity and cash dried up, Businesses closed and literally lacks of micro and small enterprises had to shut down. We need to fix that by ensuring a certain understanding on issues of liquidity and progress. Um, export competitiveness. This is becoming a real issue. Value addition of goods is very important. And I think that's, that's something we need to stress even in the services sector and even in the high tech industries. Uh, India. Uh, once had critics within our country saying, oh, what have you achieved by getting foreign companies to, to come here? All you're doing is coolie labor. They're getting you to write software codes. They're getting you to write legal documents. They're getting you to read MRIs and so on. That, uh, that, but they're not letting you do anything at the higher end of these business uh, activities. Well, what has changed here is that we have really managed to demonstrate we not only do, to do things cheaper, we do things better. We add value. Some of the most aircraft wing parts for Boeing were being manufactured in India. People don't realize when the iPod was first manufactured in China for sale in America, that the actual design of the iPod came from a company called Portal Player in Hyderabad. Uh, we are capable of coming up with good ideas, even if we don't have the manufacturing backbone to make them here. We now need to add that too which means, of course, significant capital expenditure, which requires uh, some willingness to upgrade technology. 
and a willingness to innovate in manufacturing, including, as I said earlier, bring in robots as well here, yeah, because um, some processes work better in that way, and we can have human beings looking after the robots and the machines and making sure they're working all right. But the fact is that we do need to be able to keep up with developments in the 21st century if we want to have any hope of being significant manufacturers with something to contribute uh, to the world and thereby through export. The government is proposing to prioritize 10 champion sectors. Those include the capital goods sector, um, automobiles, as I mentioned already, defense, which I've mentioned already, pharmaceuticals, and the other interesting area is renewable energy. Uh, if we can enhance even up to about 80% of what the government's own, in my view, unrealistic targets are, how much we produce by alternative energy methods like solar in particular, but also wind, I think we will be in a position to actually dramatically improve our manufacturing and make it more affordable. The unit cost of solar electricity has been plummeting worldwide. And this is the time for us to move forward. We are actually the country that helped set up globally the International Solar Alliance. It's time we walk the talk, uh, as they say. And a final point on this is the intellectual property regime. Um, this is a hugely contentious issue. I can't do justice to it in a minute. But the idea is many Western countries are saying we need some assurances on intellectual property being protected in India before we're willing to risk transferring technology to you or manufacturing in India. Because if you find out what our intellectual property is and then you steal it and you can't protect it, we can't go to court and defend our rights, then we lose out because we've invested a lot in R&D to get that intellectual property. Well, my initial attitude would be, well, first of all, India itself has tremendous brain power and we can produce intellectual property too. So we have every interest in protecting it because we want our intellectual property protected as well. It was quite shocking to see American companies patenting, uh, you know, time on a millennia old Indian intellectual property like Haldi, uh, for example, uh, which was suddenly patented in America. But there is a more complicated challenge when it comes to affordability, particularly of pharmaceuticals. Uh, the kind of patenting we do allows a company to look at a product made somewhere else, reverse engineer it, and make it through a different process. So you can't actually patent the product. You can patent the process through which you made it. But if an Indian company figures out a different way, they're allowed to do that. And that's an area of contention. But it's because Indian company is able to do that that we have become such a world leader in generic pharmaceuticals and other pharmaceuticals, and why our medicines are so affordable. I remember when I was first working in Europe in Geneva, I was horrified when I first had to buy antibiotics for an infection that a strip of 10 cost me 64 euros, um, which in today's money is about 6,000 rupees, uh, whereas the same strip of 10 antibiotics in India will cost you 20 rupees. So there's no question that there is a real uh, a challenge here because Indians are used to affordable medicines and you can understand why. Now, we've got to turn to the global picture a little bit. There is a global gloom. There's no question that what we've seen from the pandemic that is assailing the whole world now is a significant uh, setback to the world economy. Um, the world will be in recession, no question about that this year. There is not just a health crisis, which we all know about because we're living it every day, but a significant global economic slowdown everywhere as countries shut down and lock down just as we are doing. Millions of jobs are being lost. Many people's savings are being eaten up. Businesses are shutting down. Um, and, and, and in this environment, it will take a while to revive once again. The escalation of the trade war between the U.S. and China, which had already begun before COVID. You remember Mr. Trump saying a few tough things to China and, and accusing it of dumping goods and taking it to WTO and, and challenging it on various, uh, in various matters, raising tariffs on certain Chinese products. The trade war was already there, but its escalation is very likely now because of the very bitter edge that has um, arisen as a result of COVID. And though the slide doesn't say it, it's not just the USA. Japan, for instance, has announced a $2 billion investment incentive, I beg your pardon, $2 billion incentive to get companies, Japanese companies working in China to pull out and return to Japan, set up their production lines there. 
And in fact, they've also come up with a $250 million incentive for Japanese companies who can't come back to Japan but are willing to go to third countries other than China. So the mistrust of China is colossal. There is a belief that China uh, tricked the world by concealing the seriousness of the virus, its origins, its spread, and its deadly toll. And as a result, the hostility to China has never been higher. Uh, also, the disruption of supply lines, supply chains out of China meant that very many companies found their economies affected because crucial parts going into goods that they were assembling uh, could no longer be made in China, were not coming out of China. All of this had an impact on the whole world. Remember, we were in a globalized world in which your laptop contained seven different bits made in seven different countries, a screen in one country, a chip in another, a keyboard in a third, a mouse in a fourth, whatever. All of these are put together in a fifth. And in these circumstances, uh, when the Wuhan virus, the Chinese virus, as some people cruelly call it, but the COVID virus anyway, came out, there was a, a definite uh, disruption. Many, many companies suffered great losses, manufacturing got delayed, sales, exports, everything got delayed. Now, part of the result about this, uh, of this is going to be a worsening of another trend we alluded to in our earlier talks, the rise of protectionism around the world. More and more countries are going to go the route that some were already hinting at of protection, of trying to raise the barriers uh, uh, to, to save their countries from the depredations of foreign capital. But now it's much more. Many countries, the US, Japan, and India, all found leaders saying, how do we ensure we manufacture more in our country in order to ensure that um, we don't actually have to, um, have to, have to uh, depend on, on an outside country for vital supplies? And this is going to also limit global trade. In fact, um, we are already currently returning, before COVID, we had returned to the level of global, global ca capital flows of 1980, which was just before the initial uh, start of the, of the, um, of the uh, globalization experiment. And as a result, the fact is that, um, that we are looking at a very significant slowdown in global trade, accelerated further or decelerated, to be more accurate, by the COVID crisis, uh, we're going to see much, much less trade and therefore more emphasis on self-reliance, the old Indian mantra. Uh, environmental crises haven't helped. The bushfire in Australia, the Amazon forest fire. We've seen um, integrated markets in Europe being given a, a big buffeting by the decision of Britain to pull out of the EU through Brexit. Uh, the, the conflict between the US and Iran and the continuing sanctions on Iran, um, the continuing raging war in Syria, uh, all of this um, has made the West Asian region of the Middle East still rather unstable. Europe is getting refugees, but refugees are coming to other places as well. There is a, a sense very much of a beleaguered world all around with very, very few um, bright rays of sunshine in the world, the health crisis, the global economic slowdown, and so on. What the slide talks about is silver lining uh, are some of the positives we can try and glean amongst all of those. One is that companies are likely to diversify their supply chains, bringing more economic opportunities for developing countries like India. That is partially likely to be the case. I don't want to exaggerate it because some companies, and the US and Japan have shown the way, are more likely to bring businesses and manufacturing back to their own countries than to merely transform dependence on China into dependence on India or Malaysia or anywhere else. So reluctance to do that. However, workers may be able to telecommute more. And that is definitely going to be more and more happening, especially if 5G is unveiled and dramatically increases the bandwidth capacity available to all of us, I think that the habits we have acquired of doing things online are habits that we might need to be able to continue doing even in a post-COVID world. Telecommute, work from home, conduct meetings and conferences from home, stay in touch with each other, don't get on planes at every opportunity or in cars, try and create a world that benefits more from these virtual interactions. That would be very important. 
Governments might place a higher priority on healthcare. Well, India is only spending 1.28% of its GDP on healthcare. That simply is not good enough. And it seems to me that there will be a huge push, certainly my party, the Congress, and other opposition parties will be pushing it, to revise the budget to do much more to spend money on healthcare infrastructure in our country. People in turn will be more aware of personal hygiene. When I was minister in the HRD ministry, I inaugurated a UNICEF collaboration campaign called WASH to get people to wash their hands, install taps in schools, and so on. I'm not sure where that went, but I still find that lots of people weren't using soap and water for simple hygiene when COVID erupted. We need to do very much more of that. And maybe now that people are so much more conscious of cleanliness, this will become part of our ingrained habits. And we'll say namaste much more than shaking hands. And the trade in wild animals. This has been a very important factor in this virus because the wild animals, in the wet markets of China, particularly bats and other creatures, uh, they uh, transmitted the virus for the first time from animals to humans because of the trade that humans were indulging in and the consumption by humans of some of these exotic creatures resulted in viruses that normally only lived in animals coming to human beings and then being mutated and transmitting from human to human. Um, on the trade war front, is there a silver lining? Well, there's been certainly, as I already talked about it, a significant decrease in global trade and increasing political rivalry amongst nations. But um, what would aim to enhance the export of agricultural products to China in order to reduce their trade deficit? And China has an incentive in doing this because right now they have such an unfavorable trade imbalance with pretty much every country, including India. In India, I think about the last figures I saw, they have almost $60 billion of exports to us and less than $20 billion of exports from us to them. That won't do. And, and clearly, they need to be able to, to import more. Maybe that's something we can do. <clears throat> Our exports, not just, of course, agricultural products, which we do need to get more off, off the ground to be able to do that, but also exports of textiles and garments, gems and jewelry to the U.S., uh, the Chinese have a significant share of that market as the ties, but that's an area we, we might be able to grow. And of course, uh, the tension between the US and China, to which I've already alluded, will mean that the government of the US is going to encourage companies not to invest in China, even to pull out from China more and more. And some of those companies, which are used to working in Asia, they some may go to Vietnam and Malaysia and so on, but some will come to India if we can create the conditions that they will find welcoming in our market. Um, certainly, the India has been seen by the U.S. as a potential partner to come to China, and we can use the leverage that this gives us with the U.S. government to fulfill some of our geopolitical concerns as well in the Indian Ocean region, in Afghanistan, and in West Asia. But bilateral concerns which could limit our flexibility. For example, if America wants us to be a de facto ally in an effort to counterbalance China, India is likely to resist and possibly to refuse on the grounds that we have our own bilateral issues with China, our own relationship with that country, which we can't afford uh, to compromise for the sake of a partnership with the US. Uh, there are similarly other kinds of considerations about getting involved in a regular entanglement uh, uh, with the U.S., uh, which would involve a departure from our traditional reluctance to use the word ally for any foreign country. Partners are willing to speak about allies, not so. But we can come to this um, later if time permits. Um, the the um, European situation we talked about, is there a silver lining there? Well, one is, of course, the weakening of the pound because of Brexit. Um, in... in, in um, one way, of course, India's uh, imports from the UK would be cheaper because we'd be paying uh, fewer rupees for the same amount of pounds if the pound is weaker. But our exports will cost more to the Brits. So the Brits may say something that cost 100 pounds is suddenly costing 110. Do we really want to buy it anymore? And that could threaten our exports. Uh, similarly, um, the rupee might weaken just as much as the pound does, in which case the silver lining melts away. Um, Brexit might give a boost to trade ties between India and the UK. That's an argument we often hear, particularly in the UK. But how exactly? What are the products Britain 
wants to sell us that we are prepared to take. Uh, we have got various other uh, objections coming out of the government of India. For example, the government of India has been reluctant to lower tariffs uh, on things like Scotch whiskey and Jaguar cars and so on. Uh, in which case, uh, what is Britain going to try and sell us um, that would be as attractive as Europe found those items? Uh, how will how exactly will this improve? Remains to be seen. They will be free to discuss a bilateral trade pact with India, but in a bilateral trade pact, there has to be give and take. That is, that it's not enough to say, we'll sell you more, you'll sell us more. India may say, look, we don't have that much more to sell you than what we already are selling, but what we want from you in exchange for a trade concession to give you access to our market is we want, for example, more generous student visas for India. Or we want an Indian student graduating from a British college to have the right to work for two years and acquire experience before coming back to India with some savings as well. Right now, a Chinese student can do that. An Indian student can only work for two months. Now, which employer will hire an Indian student knowing that in two months they'll be gone? By the time they've learned the job, they'll have to leave. So that's become de facto a discriminatory measure against Indians by comparison with the treatment given to the Chinese in Britain. So when we say give and take, it won't just be goods. We will want certain concessions to be made by the British in order to make it worthwhile for India to in return offer them greater access to our market. Is Britain prepared to make those concessions? We've seen no signs of that so far. The other silver lining that's often suggested is that Britain will need a steady inflow of talented labor and that India, because we have an English speaking population, can provide that labor. <laughs> but their current policies are very restrictive. They have been unwilling, in fact, to give a lot of work permits and employment visas to Indians. Um, they've certainly been more generous than many other countries in the past. But will they be excessively uh, or much, much more significantly generous because of Brexit? That remains to be seen. We have seen no evidence of it so far. Um, will there be greater competitive opportunities for the Indian companies in the EU with the UK exit? That's a slightly perverse argument. The argument is that if we were competing with UK companies in the EU, uh, we'll do better. But the UK companies are non-EU companies now, and our companies are non-EU companies to begin with. So I don't particularly see this often touted silver lining as a real silver lining. Uh, however, one challenge we will face is many Indian companies base themselves in the UK in order to operate in the rest of Europe, as the UK was part of the EU. Now that that gives them no advantages, they may have to relocate to an EU member country. If they want an English speaking one, there's only Ireland left, or they'll have to go to the continent and manage uh, in a new work environment. So that too provides a big challenge for India. So not a whole lot of silver linings coming out of Brexit. Uh, geopolitically, we also have issues of the US-Iran tension in the Middle East. Um, again, looking for a silver lining in that. Uh, we did agree with Iran to pay our crude oil bills in rupees, but in the end we had to slash significantly our imports of oil uh, because of U.S. pressure. We felt the bilateral relationship with the U.S. required us to do so, so we didn't go very far with this particular deal. Um, the European states were much more successful in staying independent in their policies with Iran, uh, which challenged the hegemonic attitude of the U.S., but they too have weakened a lot in their resistance. The U.S. has been very tough, including passing a law that gives third-party punishment, that is, if a country in Europe violates, as the U.S. sees its sanctions by trading with Iran, then that country gets sanctions applied to it by American banks and American companies, and that can be a, a real problem. And finally, uh, the silver lining to the environmental crisis we've talked about is that world leaders are certainly compelled now to give serious thought to uh, sustainable development. We're going to see a lot of changes in the international political order after the Cold War. We talked about this briefly in the first talk. The rise of strongman rule of, of uh, the big powers, the US and China, um, more bipolarity in some of these areas as hostility expressed by the US mounts. No question that there will indeed be a, a, a new Cold War coming up between the US and China unless both sides show a lot more statesmanship and magnanimity than they've shown so far. Uh, nuclear threats, perhaps, I wouldn't go that far yet. Um, but, um, but what we're seeing now in the post-Cold War world, uh, after the, um, uh, the, the collapse of the, of the USSR, is the rise of a different kind of Russia, no longer a superpower, but certainly a Russia that was able 
uh, to um, play a very significant role in Europe and the Middle East, despite no longer being a superpower and that has had to be taken seriously by the US. I'm sorry I'm rushing through that slide again. We're out of time. Uh, but um, India's place in the new world order was the last slide. We have alluded to this already in both the previous talks. I'm going to skip this by simply saying, uh, as I said on both my previous talks, we have uh, the right to expect to play the role of a rule maker and not just a rule taker in international affairs, and that um, we will have a role to play if we can assert ourselves and shed some of our recent reticence. Let's move on to your questions. Um, there have been a few, and the Unacademy has chosen the following questions for me to address. Arujit Dash asks, being a former member of the UN and representing India in several international forums, what do you think the rest of the world expects from India today? Well, I think the rest of the world expects two or three things. Domestically, they expect us to get our act together. Uh, there is a lot of negative coverage around the world for domestic developments in India, particularly the unrest caused by the uh, Citizenship Amendment Bill, the sense of Islamophobia and the marginalization of the Muslim community, and the perception of growing authoritarianism by the government. The pause brought about by COVID gives the government a, a very good opportunity to rethink its approach and start afresh, reassuring the world that India isn't moving away from its emphasis on democracy and diversity. Internationally, the rest of the world expects India to handle COVID well and to do a collaborative role with other countries, which I'm proud to say I think we are doing. We are helping countries where we can. We're sending, we even sent some, um, some Indian manufacturers to other countries like China and Serbia uh, of goods that we felt we could afford to spare uh, when they were suffering earlier uh, from the crisis. Uh, we are in a position to send doctors to those countries hosting Indian expatriates who, um, uh, 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 who we can't take back into our country because of the lockdown and the flight, flight ban. So we can be responsible and collaborative in the world system. And then finally, they would want us to strengthen our economy and I think raise our economy to a point where we can actually become once again a significant player on the world stage. Um, the next question comes from Swarupa Roy. India was a part of NAM and still maintained close relations with Russia. Was this against the principles of NAM? Tough question, Swarupa. It's a historical one because all that's over right now. We signed a, a treaty, a 20-year treaty of peace, peace, friendship, and collaboration with the uh, Soviet Union in 1971 which was, at least on the face of it, a violation of our commitments in the non-line movement not to have any allies. But the government of India determined it was necessary to counterbalance the threat of the Chinese being involved in a potential war with Pakistan on the side of our enemies, and the Russians were going to counterbalance it. It seemed to have worked because neither Russia nor China needed to um, get involved in the war, and we settled scores with Pakistan eventually and created Bangladesh. But that treaty did lead to accusations that the non-aligned movement was not fully non-aligned. On the other hand, many of the non-aligned countries had greater affinities with the Soviet Union than with the Western Bloc. Cuba was, for all practical purposes, a dependency of the Soviet Union, but it was a non-aligned uh, member. Yugoslavia was a communist state. It was a non-aligned member. Uh, so you, you could argue that when Singapore left the non-aligned movement, protesting the fact that too many non-aligned countries were beholden to the Soviet Union, uh, they were not entirely wrong. But the rest of the movement accepted all this. And of course, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, your question became irrelevant. Uh, Suraj Rathor asks, the COVID pandemic has proven what Dr. Martya Sen had once said, that Indian democracy is way better in terms of crisis management than authoritarian China. While for India, better management of COVID-19 confirms this, why are other democracies such as the USA and UK doing worse than China? Tough one. Dr. Amartya Sen says democracies are generally better in responding to human needs. For example, his famous theory is that famines don't occur in democracies with a free press. If the people are starving, the press will report it, the democracy will have to be responsive and accountable, and therefore they will deal with the crisis. And indeed, uh, India's record in solving famines and even preventing famines when droughts occur and so on is exemplary, far better than most other countries in the world. But <coughs> crisis management for floods, for droughts, uh, and for famines, uh, or for potential famines, we have done extremely well. 
though it's difficult to say better than China because China hasn't had any major failures in that area either. However, we are managing COVID-19 well. China, in its authoritarian way, seems to have managed it well too. Um, very draconian lockdown in Wuhan, and then, so they claim anyway, uh, a shutdown of all the cases. There are rumors coming out of China that the large millions have been buried or cremated without anyone knowing. We don't know. China has always been a very opaque country to understand how reliable the data sources in that country are. But uh, it, it certainly appears on the face of it that China is doing at least as well as we are, if not better, in curbing uh, COVID-19. Are the US and UK doing worse than China? I would agree with the questioner, with Suraj, uh, on the grounds that, yes, indeed, the US and the UK were both slow off the mark. Uh, and that's partially because uh, they wanted not to jeopardize their economies uh, and to impose lockdown on their peoples. The result of that, however, has been a significant number of casualties, victims uh, of the illness, as well as fatalities. And that, I think, has shaken a lot of people in both the US and UK. Um, I don't think it had anything to do with their democracy, per se. In the US, one could argue that it was compounded by the fact that President Trump doesn't have the authority that Narendra Modi has in India through the National Disaster Management Act of being able to impose a lockdown on the whole country, overriding the wishes, if they were different, of the states. In the US, the president can't do that. And the 50 governors each have the right to decide on a lockdown or what degree of lockdown in their own states. And therefore, there was also an uneven pattern there. The UK doesn't have that problem. So why did the UK do worse? The only explanation I can think of is that for a while they were persuaded by the herd immunity argument. They didn't lock down, and by the time they locked down, the disease had spread. Again, I would only caution against the theory that this is about democracy. It's not. Democracies and non-democracies have all had a mixed record in the way in which they responded to this. The time will come for a post-mortem, but it won't be a post-mortem democracy. It'll be a post-mortem on crisis management. What steps should be taken, asked Ravi, to revive the Indian economy after winning the battle against COVID-19? Ravi, that's a, that's a tough question because there's a heck of a lot that needs to, do, needs to be done. Um, I think you've got to look at the global picture. COVID-19 will accelerate deglobalization. Uh, we're going to see uh, more and more fundamental shifts in the world order as countries rush to reset global supply, supply chains, raise trade barriers, conduct trade wars. Uh, countries are back off China, as we were seeing earlier, the Japanese example I gave you. Uh, as a result, the era of cheap goods made in China may all be over. Uh, we may actually see uh, things getting more expensive because they're made in more expensive countries with higher labor costs. On top of that, there'll be protectionist predilections of most global leaders. Multinational corporations are going to be under pressure to relocate their bases home or closer to home. And with the Chinese no longer being in a position to give you cheap labor and inputs uh, to, to manufacture, everyone's costs will go up and consumers in the developed countries and even in our country will have to brace higher prices. At a time of growing unemployment, that could really threaten the social order as well. What I would do uh, if I had any recommendation to give to the prime minister is to recommend that he sets up a task force for the post-COVID era, uh, not just of economists, by the way, and certainly not of bureaucrats, but a task force with the sole responsibility to focus on a post-COVID revival, representing actual practitioners in the economy, diverse sectors of the economy, both big industry and manufacturing should be represented, but also small businesses. We should have somebody from a Kirana shop or two, uh, the travel industry, the hospitality industry, the food service industries, all of which have been very, very badly affected by, by COVID. They should be on the task force. Uh, restaurants should be represented. Uh, people who run sports leagues like the IPL, BCCI should be there. Entertainment and leisure industries. All of these are industries. They contribute to our economy in a big way. We need to be able to hear what they have to say. Ask the entire task force, ask the private sector representatives, ask the small businesses and the big businesses, what do you need? If they all say give us money and handouts, they say there's a limit to how much we can give. Say instead, what can we do for you? What regulation should be abolished? What taxes can we reduce? What kind of challenges are in your way that prevented you from doing better before COVID so that we can give you a kickstart after COVID? That's the way I think we should go to revive the Indian economy. Uh, Bath asks about British nature 
deep rooted in our administration. How can we Indianize our systems, bureaucracy, defense, politics, and so on? Well, <laughs> bureaucracy is certainly a challenge. I, I wrote in my book, The Great Indian Novel, 31 years ago, that the British taught us uh, uh, the art of bureaucracy, a fine art, a crippling art form, as I said, because uh, they, their entire colonial oppression uh, of India rested on the premise that anything resulting from the filling of forms in quadruplicate couldn't possibly be an injustice. And so, so when uh, forms had to be filled in, processes, files moved, uh, bureaucratic permissions obtained and so on, uh, we, we were past masters at it. Uh, I remember when I was a student, to cash a check required nine distinct steps at the bank. So it's an insane situation we were living with. Fortunately, a lot of that has changed and simplified, but our bureaucracy is still much more process-oriented than outcome-oriented. I would want very much to see our bureaucracy being told, I, your job is to get this done. Uh, if the rules and procedures are standing in your way, Tell us what we can do to change the rules, but get it done. That should be the way in which uh, we Indianize uh, administration and bureaucracy. Defense, you're really talking about Indianization of manufacturing and production, I'm assuming, because obviously the defense services have a very strongly Indian ethos. There may be a British heritage or tradition, and some of the regiments are still celebrating battles they fought for independence. But uh, I think those traditions have stood them in good stead. Uh, pride in the service is very strong. I'm a huge fan of our defense and particularly of our army because I saw a lot of them during my UN peacekeeping days. And I realized uh, that the Indian army and the Indian defense structure is second to none in the world because I was interacting with military from around the world uh, throughout my UN peacekeeping days. So I've remained a strong fan of Indian defense and Indian military. I don't think they need much more Indianizing per se. What they do need, though, is better quality, world-class equipment, uh, streamlining of procurement policy, quick decision-making, and some more sprightliness by the policymakers in defense. And finally, on politics, that's one sector that has been Indianized. So thoroughly Indianized that English speakers like myself are finding ourselves pushed more and more to the margins because uh, though I do speak Indian languages, uh, when I express myself in English, I'm immediately accused of being out of touch with the masses. But if I speak the language I speak to win elections, namely Malayalam, no one would understand me outside Kerala. So where do we go from here? I think Indianization is all very well as a concept, but we do need to keep India united as well. And that means showing respect to all parts of India equally all regions, all states, all religions, all castes. And so Indianizing politics should not be only about Hindiizing politics, Barth, because that's what we have seen more and more, where in Parliament, our present government even answers questions asked in English, in Hindi. It so happens I can understand the answers, but there are many South Indian MPs and MPs from elsewhere who can't. And I think it's important that when we speak about Indianization, we think of the whole of India. Well, that's been, I think, it. Thank you very much for your questions. Uh, it's been an interesting discussion. We've covered a rather large amount of ground in, in the time uh, available. Um, I've, I've spoken at some length about the advantages presented by our youthful population, but I've also talked about what we need to do to actually maximize that. And there is no question that some of the, some of the questions you guys were typing in at the beginning, Lafi Bhai, Harshvardhan, and others, a question that I've already answered in the course of the talk, so I, I didn't need to answer it uh, during the Q&A. Uh, as for your other uh, questions, uh, apologies to all those whose questions couldn't be picked. Un Academy tries to represent uh, the full range of questions available, but there's only time for five or six in the 15 minutes we have reserved for you. But do listen. The table will be available on the web, and see you tomorrow at 4 o'clock for the next in our Un Academy series. Learn at home. Stay safe. Jai Hind.